Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads. Please don't speak of the event. <laughs> As usual, I am Shane. I'm Connor. And I'm Mike, and I, I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we are the Linux Lads, as usual. Um, this is Season 5, Episode 3, I believe. Dead about, yeah. 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 So, yeah, we got some feedback to start saying that, so we're going to start saying that now. Um, <laughs> um, this episode, we have some really special guests, actually. We are joined by Matthew Miller, the Fedora Project Leader, and Ed Lucena, Fedora Marketing Rep. And I'm really sorry if I mispronounced your surname. <laughs> um, how are you guys? Great. Super glad to be here. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. No worries. No, it's great. Um it was Mike's idea, actually. He 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 actually expressed the opinion to us. He said, um, we talk about Ubuntu and Arch-based stuff a lot, so it'd be nice to see what's happening on the Fedora side of things. I wasn't. I didn't think that you guys would be able to come, actually, before the release of the 33, or before the 33rd release, or before the release of Fedora 33. Any which way I say it, it sounds like you've got a lot of, lot of going on, so we are really happy to have you on. Yeah, it's, it's a little busy this week, but it's it's always busy, so now's as good any time. Uh, you are Fedora people. Uh, does it mean that you work for Fedora, or do you work for Red Hat, or do you work for IBM? Ah, excellent question. So I am employed by... Uh, Red Hat to be the Fedora project leader. Um, but my involvement in Fedora didn't start that way. I started out when I was working for a university and I started becoming a contributor that way. And then eventually um, I was working on some cloud stuff and um, Red Hat hired me to work on that. And through that, I got this job. Red Hat is currently an entirely owned company, but owned by IBM, but is operating independently. And that's going to stay that way for the foreseeable future. So the IBM purchase didn't really affect anything one way or the other. Um, I'm actually hoping that at some point it will cause greater investment from IBM into Fedora. But so far, I'm, Red Hat has significant contributions in both time and you know, hardware and people and all sorts of you know, actual money. Um, that that's continuing with no influence from IBM. Uh, meanwhile, Edward. Uh, in my case, I just uh, very enthusiastic to work in Fedora and I contribute in my free time. And also in my non-free time too, because at this time in my time zone, I'm working, <laughs> but I make a little space to be with oh, you thanks. guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We won't, we won't tell. <laughs> I, I, I certainly wouldn't record on my lunch break, so I gotta <laughs> gotta give it to you. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess we'll launch into some questions. Like, um, so one question we have is, how big is the Fedora team at the moment? It, it's hard. It's hard to um, quite quantify that exactly. There is no really one Fedora team. Like, there's no Fedora team at Red Hat. Um, there are probably um, about. Two to three thousand, maybe as many four, as four thousand people who do some little thing in as a Fedora contributor every year, uh, and that might be something from you know maintaining a package to you know writing magazine articles to do, you know documentation QA stuff or even just wiki edits. So even that little bit is you know, in the thousands. Um, of that, there's probably two to three hundred people who are very active at all times, um, and like all things, you know, it's a it's a curve where some of the you know the most active twenty do a lot of work, um, and then it kind of it trickles off from there. But there are a lot of very involved people, and uh, of those, uh, it's been a while since I actually did this analysis. But a couple of years ago, I went and looked, and about a third of that core couple hundred people were employed by Red Hat, and the others were community volunteers or working for other other companies and uh, interested in contributing to Fedora. Do they all work on uh, the... Well, I assume they don't all work on desktop. They have... There are other parts of... We know, obviously, of Fedora desktop because that's what's in, in the media, and I assume there's a server edition. Well, I think I know there is a server edition, but you kind of think that's Red Hat, right? Or CentOS. <laughs> We have basically three main editions that are uh, Workstation, Server, and IoT, I think. Cor What's the thing? Yeah, IoT and, and CoreOS is, is also in, in the mix there. Oh, so there are four. Oh. And then we have the what we call spins 
there are uh, different tested environments uh, for Fedora that are shipped directly in the ISO, so you don't have to install the desktop environment uh, separately. Uh, there we have uh, a KDE, XFCE, Cinnamon, Mate or Mate, I don't know how the word pronounced that. Mate. I think it's a Mate, but... Um... Martin Vipera uh, says Ubuntu Mate. So Mate. Ma I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Mate. Right. It's, so, so it's that's, the that's T, a... right? Yerba Mate? Mate. Yeah. Yeah. mate. So. Yeah. Reference? Yeah. Because it, yeah. So well, we have LXDE, LXQT, and we have the desktop environment from children's called SOS. And then we have the labs. The labs are specific. Uh, Objective oriented, no? There is the Python classroom. There is a gaming edition. There is a design suite edition uh, of Fedora. Uh, there is a neuro thing that I always forgot. Ne to neuroscience, name. computational neuroscience. neuroscience. Yeah, neuroscience. Absolutely. So you, you you plug people straight into Fedora or Fedora straight into people? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. Um, Some, something like that. Um, so this is basically the lot of, of, of products we have. So, but the, the, the flagship is the Fedora Workstation. That is the, our desktop environment and the server for servers for sure. IoT and CoreOS that it have the, that are the, the main editions of Fedora. And the flagship run, runs GNOME, obviously. Connor, you're trying to get in. Yeah, just as your um, I know it's a, it's going to possible history of Fedora, but you guys will be able to correct me. Didn't the uh, OLPC run Fedora? Wasn't the Sugar desktop environment or something? Yeah, that that went by in the list there. Sugar is a uh, sugar on a stick, um, and that's <laughs> that's still produced and still. Uh, uh, it's basically a bootable image that you boots you into the boots you into the sugar environment, which is you know, great for a classroom or if you want to give a computer to a kid. It's kind of amazing how intuitive. It's a weird user interface that is unlike anything else. But if you hand it to a kid, they'll figure it out so fast. Um, it, it's a lot of research. Isn't it kind it. of it's in really a cool. ring or in a spiral or something like that? It, or yeah, in some versions of it, it's been that way. I'm not sure if it's that way in the current version. Now I haven't actually looked at it for a while, but okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, until Fedora 31 was the still the ring, because I handled I handled that to my kid, so I try. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what SOAS is. I didn't know it was that. Yeah, Sugar about plastic. about seventy percent of Fedora systems out there are being used in a desktop context, as far as I can tell, um, and. Uh, the rest are servers. And that's with the caveat, actually, that I'm not counting the IoT things there because there actually are some installations with on in the order of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Fedora devices in IoT things, but it doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't, it's not comparing um, the same kind of fruit there when we're looking at those numbers. But yeah. uh, just in terms of basic system usage, um, desktop is definitely. A, a, a main you know interest in our users but we ha we have a pretty significant server use as well and uh, you mentioned you know um rel or centos being fedora server in some ways that's true these are downstream projects that are based on fedora but it's important also for things to be uh, you know that are moving fast to be integrated into a six month cycle you know rel comes out every three years and uh lasts for like a decade or more And so uh, Fedora kind of uh, you know, is the proving ground for things going in there. And one of the reasons we split out server from workstation is because there's kind of a tussle between what are the ideal features for you know RHEL and for a server operating system and what are the best for a desktop. And they're not always the same. So we wanted to have you know, different editions so we could make different choices there. Um, for um, the workstation edition, do you... Um, have a target user or organization and a kind of an amorphous um, ideal that you that you target? Are you going after a, a developer DevOps kind of person? Are you going for a, an organization that's going to roll it out into tens or if not hundreds of, of, of workstations or something like that? Yeah, our, our 
our emphasis is on students and um, individual developers, not necessarily the enterprise, although it does have features like that. But um, again, there is a RHEL product for enterprise um, enterprise use that might be more appropriate if you're an enterprise. But uh, you know, we also care about individual users. One of the the you know, things in the developer focus is that software developers are you know users as well, and so a lot of the things that are needed. Are, are just polished for making the system easy for everybody. You want to be able to listen to your music. You want to play games and things, even if you're a software developer. And so that kind of polish is important, even for that use case. So when I say it's, you know, we're aiming at developers, I don't want to scare away anybody else. It doesn't mean that it's not an easy to use operating system that you can just install and play with. But um, that is, if you are a software developer, we think Fedora is a very good choice for you. I can, uh, so I, I, I started uh, using Fedora 33 uh, on like that's the one that's just in beta now uh, some few weeks ago and uh, I, I I appreciate ease of use I've been using this Linux thing for years but I still like I still like my uh, desktops to be easy uh, is this why you chose or is there I, I, I kind of have in the back of my head like there's a relationship between Fedora and Gnome more than there, let's say, used to be the relationship between, or more than that is between GNOME and Debian, or more than that is between GNOME and OpenSUSE. Is that, is, am I right on this, or am I just imagining things? Yeah, um, yeah I think it's fair. We have, I, Red Hat puts a lot of investment into GNOME, and so the desktop team is working on you know, GNOME for the RHEL product. Their work goes into Fedora and a lot of investment. Like, for example, um, in the new Fedora release, you will see if you, do a fresh install or create a new user, a new uh, how to use the desktop intro video that comes up. Yeah, and I that was that's... created. Uh, you know that 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 was made by Red Hatters to make Fedora easier to use, right? So that's a, um, and that was done in the GNOME upstream, but it was done you know be, uh, as an investment in Fedora as well. And a lot of the a lot of the work that goes into Fedora goes in you know into GNOME upstream. And there's just a lot of overlap between the communities. There are people who identify as both Fedora people and GNOME people. And is it like that GNOME has got vast majority of Fedora users, desktop users are on GNOME, or is it more like let's say fifty fifty between Fedora and everything else? Or if you know, like. Yeah, you know, I don't actually know of, uh, of the the GNOME breakdown. Uh, I know for Fedora users, um, GNOME is uh, you know I said seventy percent of the desktop uh, is the desktop, um, and GNOME is a comfortable majority of that. With the other ones coming in at like five or so percent for the other alternative ones. Um, Pe people uh, for the most part tend to stick to defaults. It's it's just it's one of those things where yeah. Yeah, they yeah, stick I'll... to the default team. They'll stick to the default wallpaper. Though, <laughs> so the wallpaper is lovely this time. Except for you know Linux enthusiasts who like to have our <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> One of the things we do in Fedora is make it so you can have those options, and if that's what you want to work on, like we make a space for people to build those things, in, you know, in part of Fedora properly as part of the actual Fedora release and everything. I think that's kind of a cool thing. So it's not a sub, you know, a side project or something. It's actually you know, part of Fedora. Uh, one th one thing that I did notice, um, just as you're speaking about giving users choice and being able to customize things, one things I I knew, uh, I mean. I'm using Cinnamon, so I don't use uh, Edueta as my default um, team. Um, so I w had saw announcements and saw that there was a way to dark and a way to dark is looking cool and saw screenshots. So I was in there and I wanted to enable Edueta dark rather than the, the default um, light version of uh, Edueta. Uh, I, when I was in the settings, I couldn't see anything obvious. Um, but I've I've used GNOME in the past, so I went into the uh, store or the um, GNOME shop or store and installed GNOME tweaks. And sure enough, there it was in the drop down menu. I was able to select Edway to Dark. Um, I don't. Maybe it's just me not being that familiar with it. Is there an is there an easy way to change to Edway to Dark if it's installed by default? Um. Is it easy to install without having to go in and install um, GNOME tweaks? I yeah, I think my my understanding is that it's going to be a feature when they feel like it's ready, but that the 
right now um, it's th things that are in the tweaks are sometimes experimental or not not ready for prime time but um, you, that gives you the option if you know what you're doing of turning it on is it this this so so you said you want so if fedora is um, kind of easy to use a distro i, I it I kind of so 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 having the experience of it, I kind of uh, miss the comfort of knowing what to do and what not to do. So there's a lot of bad advice online, and there's a lot of outdated advice online that used to be good, right? So I'm thinking, okay, I want this piece of software, and it's not in the repos that I can find out using DNF, which by the way doesn't tell me which packages are installed. It just that's that's an aside that should DNF search. Um, doesn't tell you what's in, if it's installed or not. If you do DNF search um, RG, it will show you that RG package exists, but I don't think it tells you that it's installed. I think anyway, it, so it actually breaks it down into different does sections. It? It, does it? it? Yeah, it does. Ah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I'm giving out to you for for no reason. Anyway, um, I was saying, <laughs> I was saying something else. Um, yeah. So basically, if if I, I know, for example, that uh, on Ubuntu, if I install PPAs, I am doing that at my own risk, and I risk that the PPAs are going to be gone in a year, and uh, I'm going to be stuck with outdated software. Uh, similar for the AUR on Arch. Yeah, uh, what on Fedora? I'm I'm looking. Okay, so the software is not in the repos. There is a there is a flat pack, but maybe I don't want a flat pack because uh, I'm not too comfortable with flat packs. There is a snap, but the snap isn't installed. The snap store isn't installed by uh, on uh, by default. You can do it, but should you do it? And there's also a repo in something called Copper, but Copper doesn't seem to work like the AUR. So this kind of just just about installing packages. Are there like do's and don'ts that that would be current? Like, definitely don't do this, and if you do this, beware of that. So yeah, um, there are there. Uh, Copper is our system that's like the PPAs in some ways, although it's a little more centralized. Uh, where basically everything in there it needs to be open source and freely redistributable under a good for Fedora license, but um, it can also be more experimental. It doesn't necessarily need to meet our generally pretty stringent packaging quality guidelines, um, but it lets people play with things and maybe um, you put alternative versions of things in there. I actually just needed it recently because I'm trying to play the Baldur's Gate 3 early access on Fedora. Nice. And, uh, and apparently that currently doesn't work with the Mesa Vulkan driver. You need to have an alternative um, AMD VLK driver, and someone had made a copper of that. Um, that uh, I installed and now the game works, so that's awesome. Um, but uh, it, it lets lets people do things like that. But you're right; it's kind of like a PPA. There's no guarantee that that package won't, you know, continue to be updated or that it, it's even a good idea to install it. Um, but so there's the kind of the wild west. There also are a number of um, third party repositories um, for Fedora um, that. Um, contain things that we can't ship. Um, there's a very popular one, uh, which uh, you'll find lots of advice on that is that is good advice. Um, I, I, I won't point you at it for, for reasons, um, but uh, things that Fedora can't properly include for legal reasons can can be found in some repositories that are have been around for a long time and are uh, trustworthy. Uh, I'm, I'm alluding to, I'm going to allude to something that is perfectly there plain and simple so it's uh, not um off the beaten path but is let's say if you're installing uh, something that uh, on a fedora on some um hardware that has an nvidia card there'll be a pop-up saying add this rpm fusion for the proprietary driver yeah. that kind of thing is it yes so right that, that yeah that 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 happens um and that's that actual that's that is in a specific repo there that is authorized that we have uh le legal clearance to do it this way um, we can't include general repositories that are not fedora out of the box because um, we'd have no control over what would be in there um, but yeah so if if you uh, when when you first start up your system you're actually given the option to enable proprietary software repositories and so there's some select software there i think it's steam the nvidia driver and chrome um, because 
again, you know, pe pe people like Steam, and if and you know, you need it to get your hardware going. If we don't have those options, people aren't going to say, "Oh, good, Fedora is fighting for free software. I won't use my computer." They will go and install an operating system that that works. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I would say. I have a high. Uh, yeah, I have a hybrid hybrid Nvidia laptop for my for my synths. So um, yeah, that's that's why oh, that's why I Bumblebee. asked. So on the whole, uh, on the whole, so you, Fedora comes with Flatpak in it uh, for because do you do you does the Fedora is the Fedora team invested in Flatpak? And when it comes to yeah, Snap, absolutely. And uh, sorry, so it's a kind so, of two part question. Uh, so yes, uh, your investment in Flatpak, and then do you uh, do you would you advise people, and not for philosophical, but for technical reasons, not to use Snaps on your system, or is it okay to install the SnapD daemon and and use Snaps on your on Fedoras, on Fedora? Yeah. yeah so um, you you can do what you like. Uh, no 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 judgment. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are definitely people in Fedora, and a lot of the the people in Fedora with overlap with GNOME are working very hard on Flatpak and you know, on FlatHub, and then also on automatically converting Fedora packages into another source of Flatpaks, which I think is kind of a cool project because then you get kind of the level of review and, excuse me, trust that you might have with the distribution packages. You're not just, like, like you said earlier, you know, maybe I don't, don't know where this flat pack comes from with the fedora source you know that this went through the fedora package review that it's all open source that all these things are, are true about it um snap um, I, i'm glad that snap works on fedora and it's awesome that the people have done that um snap by design is meant to really link you to a canonical owned source of software and um you know that's not super exciting to <laughs> me um and uh, so in that way, it's very different from um, the way the way Flatpak works. Uh, Flatpak also has a design. So um, I, and I don't know the current state of this, but the way sandboxing works in uh, in Snap is very much based on app armor and some things like that. And so translating that to, to the SE Linux security framework that we have in Fedora, I don't know what the state of it is. I don't want to spend spread too much FUD, but I, I know it was bad at one point. Um, so I don't know how well the sandboxing works on Fedora at this point. That doesn't mean it's not that your software is not available, but sandboxing might be an issue. Um, I would like all these things to be better. I think more choice for people and where they get their software from is good for everybody and good for Fedora. With, uh, the reason why I use Snaps mostly is because, uh, well, JetBrains IDEs, and there's a lot of them. They are all in Snaps. They are in Flatpak as well, but JetBrains basically uh official are the, are the snaps uh, to you guys uh, or does fedora so so uh, that's because canonical went to JetBrains, they went to microsoft and they went to all these people and say how can we help you to package this as a snap do you guys do this with uh, i know probably maybe not with proprietary software like the JetBrains ides but do you guys go to uh, different developers and try to persuade them to uh, package your uh, package their packages for Fedora or for as a flat pack, for example. Um, generally, I mean, for proprietary software, we don't. Um, we we certainly like people to you know be involved in packaging software in Fedora in general. Um, I think the GNOME and Flatpak team has you know, basically made that. Uh, kind of around FlatHub as a sort of a vendor neutral place for things, and I see that as a perfectly sensible place for like proprietary software to be that's never going to be part of fedora but FlatHub can be kind of a central location for that kind of thing so people can get their spotify on fedora <laughs> also also we have a, we have a very very good uh a, a space to work with flat uh, or experiment that work with flat packs that is the the silver blue that is uh, most intended to work uh, with uh, with flat packs and angus three. Yeah, that's a cool thing. I think a lot, a lot of people is working with that, and it, it, it's amazing. It's just a, a immutable operative system that build the the image every time you update or or install everything, and it works like it was one unit of software. That, that is amazing. I was tr trying it uh, for a bit when it was or. Just release it, and the paradigm of 
auto updates and the world that the the how the operative system works is really really good. Yeah, I, I could take a diversion into that for a little bit. Uh, Silver Blue is basically um, a desktop operating system put together with the same technologies that came from uh, Fedora Atomic and from CoreOS. Basically. Uh, your operating system binaries are managed in the same way like a Git repository, so they're version controlled and you can check out different versions and go back um, back and forth and you basically update by rebasing to a newer, newer version on the update stream. And so this means, uh, although you can do some local customizations just like you can in software development with your own Git clone, um, you can basically uh, follow a, a tested together set of software rather than kind of assembled with packages because everybody's laptop you know, using RPM or Deb or whatever after a couple years of use probably is completely unique in what is installed on it and it makes QA a combinatorial nightmare of things. So with this you can actually say you know this commit is actually this system and everybody's system will actually be at that exact same point. And of course, if you have problems with an update, you can roll back to an earlier version and cool things like that. Um, but that's for the base operating system. And then the idea is that your uh, individual work you do in a toolbox container, like a, a pet container environment, and that your applications come you know, either as um, Podman containers or as flat packs for actually running on top of that. The thing, first thing that you said reminded me of how Intel Clear Linux works on the backend, I think. Um... Similar, you basically build the whole thing, and uh, yeah. But the the, the downside of of uh, Silverblue is that whenever you install software, you have to reboot because you basically you move the whole thing one version up. Right. Yeah. So so the idea is hopefully to move most of the software out of that core and make that core very small, so that you're when you update applications as flat packs, those are updated without having to reboot because they're in a kind of a separate space. But then you do reboot to update. Is is this a lot? Is this used a lot on workstations, or is it more server or IoT kind of so, thing? Right. So Silverblue is specifically to use it as a workstation, and I don't have actual numbers on how many people are using it, but I know we have a lot of interest and enthusiasm about it, and I think it it very well may be the future of where, where we're going. Um, I, I I'm just picking an example off the out of the top of my head, but it sounds like something very similar to how Google is trying to do it with Android, where they're trying to focus less on the core and that the the software the um the parts of Android will be in the Play Store and they'll be updated whenever there's an update rather than updating everything at once. Yeah, absolutely, it's the same kind of concept. Although um, I think Google is doing that in some ways to assert more control over their ecosystem. Yes, and to, uh, you know, to avoid having <laughs> everything be open source, which um, which is not our motivation here. But so there is a new release of Fedora coming out. Uh, Fedora 33. Does it mean there's been that there is it actually the 33rd release, or is there some kind of a gnome shenanigans, gnome line shenanigans that the previous one, previous one was 3.1 or something? No, no, we've actually done this, yeah, 33 times now. Kind of amazing, um, and uh, 13 of them as me as Fedora project leader. How many? How many? Uh, 13 of them with me as a Fedora project leader. Uh, oh wow. Wow. Yeah, wow, that is a lot, yeah. Lucky number. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh so what 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 is in it? Uh what is new in Fedora thirty three? Uh the the, the the meatest stuff, the nice thing, you know. If there is a new version of system D that probably is not that interesting unless it does it does something that the user can actually interact with. So so I think the way the way I phrased this question was anything shiny for desktop users uh, or is it mostly under the hood stuff? <laughs> Uh, so there is a lot of under the hood stuff, which is, um, I think, exciting for enthusiasts and exciting for potential. Um, one of um, one of the big things for desktop is we're switching the default file system to ButterFS, which uh, has a lot of cool potential as a next generation file system. But from my point of view as project leader, um, if nobody notices that will be an excellent success for the first release. I would <laughs> like it to be very non-dramatic because um, that that's what should happen with um, with file systems. Um, but it does actually give us um, the potential in the future to have some nice user uh, user level features with snapshots and um, backups and restores and things like that. That um, will be cool. Um, 
yeah, there's there's a question here. I think Mike put it in. Um, um, is uh, Butterfest going to be baked into GNOME files? And then I I kind of went along with that and said, if you had some kind of visual snapshot management, would be interesting. But I imagine that that would be very hard to design for. But just the whole concept of snapshots being integrated into your file manager, how would that? be uh, how would a user interact with that visually i think it exists already uh, with not with fedora but with the bsd guys have got something and they have got some kind of a desktop environment uh, other than what's normally used on linux and they have zfs baked into it i think um yeah but so yeah so basically yeah yeah that's that's what i because, because i looked you know i, I installed fedora 33 and i'm thinking okay i have butter fs so yeah it's very boring actually i have to say which probably makes you extremely happy uh, <laughs> excellent i'm glad to hear that that's what file systems i think that that's working as designed <laughs> um <laughs> n- not what i've been promised by people who like zfs to be honest either <laughs> there's a lot of that going around as well um to me, I don't, I don't really get the appeal of uh, ZFS, as you say, ZFS, as as it's known where I'm from. Uh, I don't get the appeal of it uh, on on a desktop system. It's a it's a server, a file system, um, and yeah, and um, you know, it's something that uh, for legal reasons, you know, like um, we we can't include that in Fedora. So it will there will never be a ZFS unless things really change on. Um, the on the ownership uh, side of that, yes. The, or, um, on, if 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 the cuddle changes into a hug, um, if you if you, <laughs> yeah, as as Connor asked, is that so? So you said there's going to be features coming in. Is is there going to be? Is there a plan to basically integrate and to make visually accessible uh, all the features of BTRF or ButterFS that exist on the command line, like snapshotting, uh, send, uh, snap, you know, uh, BTRFS send. That kind of thing. I really don't know. You know, volume management. Uh, yeah, we don't have specific. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we don't have specific plans around that, but um, I th- hopefully, I, th- I think those things are. We have the groundwork for those things to happen now. Uh, that's f- first. We have to have the the um, boring nothing. Nothing happens with the file system release, and then we one, can build on top of that. One, one thing I noticed is that you cannot, uh, at least not trivially, uh, you cannot uh, add. Uh, encrypt the whole thing you cannot make an encrypted disk is that is that like a big technical problem for to 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 to, to enable? so uh there is a encrypt your whole disk option at the beginning of the installer but that's actually done on the level of the block device rather than on um on the uh, the butterfest file system i hope in the future that we can actually have that as a butterfest feature i think that would be a nice one um, and one of the problems is right now if you once you've encrypted it um, if you have an already installed system um, it's hard to it's hard to to um, go from there so for example we now have these fedora laptops that come from lenovo with fedora pre-installed on them which is awesome but if you come with a free pre-installed system and you want to be like uh now encrypt my disk the way to do that is to reinstall which kind of defeats the purpose of having a pre-installed system so yeah that having encryption that you can you know check after the fact and have an encrypt your disk would definitely be a feature i'd like to see i don't think that's actually there in upstream butterfs yet but um sometime for the future for sure so yeah i just wanted to come out of hibernation here to um (laughs) to uh i i just wanted to take it in a slightly different direction ed we haven't spoken to you in a while so i was curious um you know as you're the marketing rep for fedora um there's a lot of talk lately about um how linux is marketed and presented to the public as uh, a user choice so I was just curious to hear your thoughts on that and you know what what you think we could improve on the marketing end of Linux. Uh well, uh actually that's a great question because for example we are working in in Fedora with a team we call Mindshare that is a collection of all the representatives that uh of the contributor that are not in the technical part of the distribution that it nor developers or packagers or anything there's what we call uh, people people that uh the interest the idea is to uh take the how to uh bring fedora to the people and we have a program called ambassadors that it is 
been redesigning to improve this because we have uh, community collaborators everywhere in the world and they, they tend just to make a, a talk a Linux in Southwest, the thing that we are used to do in the 90s, early 2000s, that works and it's not working anymore. So we are trying to make more, uh, in, take more initiative, like uh, improve our YouTube channel, uh, make podcasts that is uh, still a thing and try to do um, uh, stuff that are more aligned to the modern marketing of things. No. Uh, we are trying to potentially uh, our our Instagram uh, account too. That we have a uh, uh, people tend to criticize that we use uh, proprietary social networks like Twitter, like Facebook. But we say we need to be where people is. True. Are we on you know? TikTok? So you... <laughs> we are on TikTok. <laughs> Can we see like a or a dance routine or something on TikTok? <laughs> when is uh, out of uh, of China? maybe <laughs> we'll 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 promote fedora through the through the medium of k-pop on tiktok or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um. no but but um no out of joke uh the idea for example that i uh i i'm running a seek that is called a special interest group inside fedora for the i3 window manager oh, cool. and uh one thing that we are doing now is that one of uh we run meetings uh uh, every two weeks and we run one in IRC our legacy communication media that is working still and is the way that how the Fedora project communicates and we are doing one by video and we are publishing those videos in YouTube so people is, uh, is, is getting more interested because they are seeing how we work it's not only a black box Fedora works you don't know mm -hmm. how no, we are trying to make people to understand that we have meetings, we discuss things, and we are we make agreements so you can contribute and your voice is heard inside the project. It's not just that you can use it; you can say, "Hey, I don't I don't like this, or I want to do this mm -hmm. change. Uh, how we, how can we contribute this change to make inside the the project?" You're basically, trying to con create a community or cultivate a community obviously you have a community but trying to improve it uh, two things two things that you mentioned there reminded me of um, how mozilla are doing things is i think mozilla recently transitioned from irc over to matrix and um don't they generally have um open meetings as you describe as in if they're having a meeting amongst the team, it's it's a public link and anyone can join and make a comment or something. I, I, if if that's wrong, well, then please actually, correct me. Actually, for our meetings, we still don't have uh, the bridge from Matrix, but we have a lot of community in Matrix. Also, the design team is in Matrix, the Mindshare team is in Matrix, the Council team is in Matrix. So yeah, we are trying to not not to move away from IRC because I think IRC is still is still our uh, primary way of communication but to see how we can attract more users because people don't like plain text the me the plain text part is for all users or power users like maybe we are here in the call but for general people they don't like the plain text they want emojis they want to share a picture inside the client they don't have to publish it and just send the link and this kind of little things is that that is the, the thing that May uh, say take people away from the project that you only have text chat. No, we are in tre Telegram. We have a very very vibrant community in Telegram that is uh, reached two thousand people at some point. It was people just b looking for support, and after they get support, they do support. Yeah, I was going. I was going to make the joke of every everyone wants to share their gifts, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to share our gift. I think that's true. <laughs> the world needs dank memes. Yeah. To me, it's important always that we can bridge this. Like, I, I, I will be very happy when we can bridge this. We, we, we are attempting something like this with, uh, you know, in the Linux, in the Dublin Linux community, we are attempting to bridge IRC and Matrix. But the technology is, well, nascent is the best word for it. You know, it's, it's, it's not where I would like it to be. You know, it's, it's one. It's, okay, if you don't want to see, if you don't want to see gifs, uh, or if you want to have to click on a link so that you can see them that's absolutely fine but if you do want to see a gif and you shouldn't 
be deprived of that just because somebody sent it from a slightly different chat client. You know, that's, I, I would like all of them to be connected and then people can choose and come from wherever, you know, it's, I, I, I'm sure you guys are people of community. So obviously, you know, the, the easiest it is to, for people to connect to whatever, wherever you want them to be connected to the better for everybody. Yeah. IRC really has, I, it, it can be a barrier, especially when you get into like, you know, registering your Nick with Nick serve and all of these like things that are, uh, you know, maybe pain we went through a while ago, but it, it can be, it can be very intimidating and just kind of IRC culture. And then knowing that you've got to set up your client to not show you a bunch of the messages or else your channel will be overrun with annoying things. And like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a different culture from using, you know, a messaging client. It's kind of why people are attracted to things like, you know, Slack or whatever else. Um, and, you know, hopefully open source things like, uh, yeah, Matter Element most. Matrix, Matter Most, um, Matter most yeah. Rocket Chat. Um, I, I actually would love to see um, some of the major IRC networks like Freenode integrate that integration at the server level rather than being done with bots and bridges and things like that, because I think that could actually work more and then maybe people could kind of move over to the modern thing i mean a lot of the problem is if you've got concepts that don't exist in text irc like you know threads or reactions how do you represent that to the plain text irc it's almost impossible um so it's it's hard uh, and this this is speaking to Edward just in a very broad overview of not speaking about any, anything that the Fedora project is doing or anything, but just the whole problem with marketing to um, to future Linux users. I think it was um, uh, Martin Wimpress who says, go where the people are. And so there's the IRC, which is perceived as the old fuddy duddies with neck beards. I'm not saying it's that's all of them, but that's the... That is a perception of them. Uh, and there's people who use things like t Telegram, Matrix, uh, Mattermost, um, so on. And then uh, Martin Wimpress was even saying, yeah, but the future of uh, potential Linux users is in neither of those two areas. It's actually on Discord because that's where all the 20-somethings and so on are, are hanging out in. So... Uh, they, I think, on their podcast, they almost resided to the fact that said we're going where the audience is, whether it's proprietary or not. Um, so, do you have any comments on that? If you see if that if there's a generational shift of of users that we're just not um, targeting because we're not on things like uh, Discord or or TikTok. TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are also on on Discord. Are you on Discord? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we're we're going to have to get the finger out and go on Discord then. How do you make it all work though? How do you because you have got a bunch of people here, a bunch of people there, but the the bridges don't work. How do you how do you connect them? Because ideally, you would want the neckbeards to be talking to the children because the neckbeards have the know how, and the children have the future, right? So you want to, you want to connect them. You don't want to go. You don't want to just say I'm not talking to the neckbeards because I want to be where the young people are. Because then you are the only neckbeat with a bunch of young people, and that has got very bad connotations. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, uh, so, so, so you you want to you want to be how how do you how do you make sure that your community actually works, even though everybody and their dog has got their own chat platform? Yeah, uh, it's a difficult problem. I think first of all, not all of our old school contributors are neckbeards. We've got uh, <laughs> lots of a diverse a diverse set of people, uh, women and um, men who do not have beards at all, uh, let, let alone neckbeards. <laughs> we're, uh, we're, we're using it in the tongue in cheek way. It's, a, uh, it's almost yeah, like yeah. a term of uh, endearment at this stage. Just wanted to to, to make that clear um but but uh so that to your actual point um yeah it's kind of a mess um one of the things we do is a ge generally different groups and working in different areas tend to have their preference like uh, like I, um the design team for example uh, works a lot on matrix because they can share graphics back and forth and that kind of makes sense uh and then then they have that bridge to an irc channel as well so there's at least that bridge uh, but one of the things we actually worked on recently is making a team directory in fedora because like i said it's a big project with you know thousands of people involved and so one of the basic things in the team directory is where does this group do its communication and meetings and right now that's different for a lot of different groups um 
but at least we have the way that you know each group can tell this is where our group interacts. Um, I don't think that's ideal, but I don't see any ideal right now. So uh, there's a lot of, well, we'll do what's good enough in, you know, Fedora in general and open source. So you mentioned that that uh, you obviously don't have only men with long beards, but also uh, women. Do you have, as a project, do you have um, diversity policy? Do you try to go, because Linux and tech in general, it's very uh, it, it, it tends to be monoculture, you know, we don't have to go into the reasons, we don't have to go into the politics or anything, but it, if you look around at a Linux convention, you know what you see, like usually, at least this side of the, this side of the ocean, it's uh, usually black guys, uh, white guys my age, right, which is yeah. uh, not ideal, uh, because you want people who are younger, you want other points of view, at least from my, from, at least more, at least that's where I stand, yeah. right, so does Fedora try to go and uh, not recruit, but to uh, introduce itself to people who maybe uh, you know are culturally not that close to tech at all, or you know who have a, who have a harder uh, possible. Yeah, uh, you know, is is Fedora trying to be inclusive? Thank you, uh, Edward. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So one of the things we're really proud of actually is that. Uh, so we just had a Fedora Women's Day event, where we had some of the women oh, in Fedora. Uh, kind of talk about their experiences and you know, the difficulties and the good things. And it was, I, I was, I was very inspired. It really made me feel really good about Fedora and the things we're doing and just kind of, you know, how Fedora as a project has helped people, you know, find who they are and come into, you know, sometimes some really successful careers um, with Fedora as a, as a base. Um, that, that was amazing. And one of the things, uh, Marie Norden, who is the, um, F Cake, Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator, a <laughs> um, complicated title that she got saddled with, but has um, uh, owned very well. So uh, she was saying that you know, when she got involved in Fedora, uh, you know, five or six years ago, she felt like she was one of the only women at, at our conference. Like you were saying, you look out and it's a, it's a sea of men. Um, and that now, uh, although it's still a minority, that when you, you go to a Fedora conference you know, online or in hopefully in real life again sometime soon um that there you know there's a lot more women who are just there and be, being part of the project so i think that's a big success we also have a lot of global diversity where we have people from uh different parts of the world from south america from india from you know russia from europe united states uh all all kind of working together on, on making this this thing so that that's a, another source of diversity that we uh, celebrate and try to make sure that we are are um, doing justice to, I think. Uh, we work on languages and things. That is kind of a neat a neat thing that Fedora does. Yeah, for example, in the Fedora Woman Day, we have a, a, a space when you can speak in Spanish, in Hindi, I think. Oh, in hold English. on, I've got a cat who's and... speaking sad cat. Just a minute, let me let <laughs> oh, we, we heard that. <laughs> and the, the idea of, of those part of the Fedora Woman Day that was uh, held in online is that you can just pick your culture. You don't have to be speaking always in English. That is most, even when it's the central language for, for Fedora, you can have spaces in your own language uh, to, to, to be in an event because the, you can sure for, for sure speak with someone in your own language, but uh, being recognized as a part of the project that speaks Spanish, that speaks Portuguese, that speaks Russian, that speaks Hindi, is is huge because you have. Uh, for me, for being from Latin, uh, is is great to to be recognized as a part of the project. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that that sounds absolutely fantastic. I mean, I'm I'm looking at the, as you were speaking there, I was looking at the year um, diversity and in inclusion uh, page here, and it's 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 fantastic. Yeah, it's very inspiring. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 that's, that's the kind of feedback that's nice to get. So um, that brings us to the closing chapter of today's episode. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. So just to close up, um, Matthew, Ed, have you guys got any uh, la last comments you'd like to make or any shout outs you'd like to give out? Yeah. Super shout out for Fedora 33 release hopefully coming out on Tuesday. There's a tiny, tiny chance that we've got a technical problem we've got to got to hold off for, but um, al almost certainly on Tuesday. Uh, and that's going to be very exciting with the new GNOME release for uh, desktop. 
and the IoT edition being an official edition. Um, I think that we, we didn't talk very much about that, but I'm excited about that. It's one of the you know importance for the future of Fedora is that IoT is a way for people at home uh, to get into computing in a way that is very tangible. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, just a lot of nice stuff in this new release. Woohoo! Right. Yeah, also, uh, you can find us on Twitter at Fedora and in Facebook as Fedora Project, and you can check the Fedora podcast that is available in all major uh, podcast uh, publishers like uh, Google, iTunes, uh, Spotify, and also um, uh, just go and check the new Fedora. It will be awesome. It's just, just one last thing. If somebody wants to become a member of the Fedora community and they have a very particular set of skills, like maybe they are a budging developer, or maybe they are a budging graphic designer. Is there like a one place where they should go and say, or or their Liam Neeson? Yeah, or if if they can kidnap, if they can retrieve kidnapped people, uh, <laughs> are they? I actually haven't seen the movie. Surprise, surprise. But anyway, <laughs> uh, can is there like one portal? You know, the web one point oh yeah. web portal where they could go and say, I'm here. There's there's actually two different places. One is a thing called What Can I Do for Fedora dot org, which uh, steers you to different groups. It's kind of a cool thing. And then we also actually have a join Fedora team whose basic job is to set people up with where they need where they want to be in the project. So you can introduce yourself to the join team, and they'll help you make the connections you need to make. So. Um, you asked for one, I gave gave you two. One is the more self directed. What can I do? And then just find the join team, and they'll they'll plug you into where you need to go to rescue your kidnapped daughter from whatever murderers. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. That's Thank cool. You. That's cool that you have so many resources for that kind of thing. I've never seen that before. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I just want to thank uh, Matthew and Ed for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, it's been a really informative episode. So, thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Fun to be here. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Edward, do you have any official socials that you want to share as well? Uh, for myself, you can ch- uh, check for X3M. Yeah, just that's three letters. <laughs> it will be super easy. <laughs> in Twitter uh, and Fedora at, yeah <laughs> and the Fedora is Fedora on Twitter Fedora Project and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram so you can look cool. for them so uh, yeah this has been a great episode uh, thank you for joining us guys um, as for our socials um, you can find us uh, Linux Lads across the board at Linux Lads on Twitter and uh, Linux lads on Mastodon, I believe. The link will be in the show notes. If you go linuxlads.com forward slash thing, you'll find us there. Uh, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash store if you want to buy a t shirt or a mug. One mug I am actually drinking from right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's the new logo I've I'd So I'm, I'm presenting it to here. the camera buy that you it. can't see. Um, buy it. <laughs> Mike is doing the subliminal marketing there. Um, but yeah, we would be. It would be really cool if you want to buy a T-shirt with our artwork on it. That would be very nice of you. Um, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash donate if you want to just give us money without getting a T-shirt in return. But uh, I don't know. I think the T-shirt sounds like a better option. <laughs> and fun fact: if you played this uh, episode backwards, it's uh, Mike reading out the the uh, store web link. <laughs> Backmasking. Yeah. I think they you call know. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ivan Ethniash, Ivan Ethniash, Ivan Ethniash. <laughs> if anybody remembers The Simpsons. I, uh, um, I forgot one thing. Uh, email us show at linuxlads.com and our Telegram group, you, linuxlads.com forward slash Telegram. Um, so yeah, that's it really for, for today and for this week. See you again in two weeks. Um, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. And for the 50th time, I've been Mike. F- 50th time? <laughs> Yeah, 50th. It's, it, I just realized it. I think this is the 50th episode. Oh, okay. I wish Ooh. I'd known if, that If you don't in. count the postponement <laughs> and announcement, yeah. and if you don't count the, 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 the one that's only Connor did by himself. So actually, I wasn't here 50 times because I went on holidays for twice or three times. But yeah, this is the 50th episode. So Connor I, has I, been on the show 50 times. I did one by myself. 
Yeah, so no, video is 55. You completely ruined the outro, but it's a good for a good reason. Yeah, <laughs> I keep doing that, right? Uh, so yeah, you yeah, there we go. I'm, Fifty I'm, episodes I'm, of Linux. I'm, I'm the only person who's been here every single. Episode. And Connor, yeah, Connor's the only person who's been for here for every single one. Um, yeah. the re- uh, me and Mike have been lazy so and sos who've missed ones here and there. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that's totally impressive. That I and I try to to ruin the Fedora podcast. We have two seasons, and it's absolutely crazy try to ruin this uh, thing for so long. And so, congratulations for your podcast. Oh, thank thanks. you, thank you, thank that's you. Cool. Always good we're, to hear from fellow podcast podcasters. So um, that's a great yeah. note to go out on. We've been the Linux lads. See you in two weeks. <laughs>